really find the divine in water. And the woods is where I find the divine for me. It's a, it's a great place to just connect. I see him, see him in my wife. My wife shows me a lot of God through her actions. So. Watching a gorgeous sunset. I see a lot of it in nature. I do a lot of walking. When people are at their best, <laughs> yeah. I see divine in the world, yeah. Yeah, like my grandma, I can see it in her. I guess I find more divinity in nature than I do in anything else. Hi, welcome to In Search of the Divine. I'm Ann Thompson. And on today's show, we're going to be looking at creative ways people access the divine. We'll talk to a priest who writes music. We'll talk to an artist who uses her paintbrush to discover and uncover the divine. We'll talk to an innovative woman who's made massage therapy accessible for all of us. Stay tuned. If you ask Father Jan Michael Jonkis to describe himself, he'll say things like, Large family, I'm eldest of seven. Did an undergraduate degree in English. Got ordained in 1980, associate pastor at Presentation. Then three years as education coordinator and campus minister at Newman Center. Then four years of uh, doctoral studies in Rome. My real work is as a priest, and probably as a priest, professor educator. What's interesting is that he doesn't mention the fact that he's also a musician and a composer. Yeah, that's avocation, not vocation for me. shouldn't have been successful. Uh, it's a very wide-ranging song. It demands the congregation to sing an octave and a fourth, which is really, it's as big as uh, the Star Spangled Banner, which is also really hard to sing for most people. Uh, there's some tricky rhythmic things in it, but it's somehow connected with people. Mike, as he prefers to be called, wrote On Eagle's Wings in response to the death of a friend's father. But it was a while before he came to fully appreciate the composition's impact. When people started stopping me to say, you know, you don't know me, but blah, 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 blah. And then uh, the second is as it started to be translated into other languages. You know, I'd get a request, can we do this in Spanish? Can we do this in French? Can we do this in Polish? Uh, the, the, honestly, the weirdest thing, uh, Luciano Pavarotti's funeral. I'm watching it, right, uh, Rai Uno, the, the, the uh, Italian television system, is broadcasting it from Modena. And uh, they get to the part of the ritual where they're going to sprinkle the casket with holy water and then bear it out of the church, commendation rite. The choir soprano stands up and starts singing Suagli di Aquila. <laughs> and it's just wild to hear you know, your, your song being done at an event like that in a language that you don't understand, but that I, you never wrote it in. So I think that probably really indicated it had, it had gone around. Whether it's through Mike's academic vocation or his musical avocation, his search is ultimately about mystery. I think very, very early, as far back as I can trace it, I've had a a sense, and I, this gets tongue-tied for me, but a sense of, of a kind of overwhelming mystery at the core of things. And it's, um, it's all-encompassing. It integrates, uh, but it's very mysterious to me. The theologian in me, 
right, wants to name this as a God experience and, you know, talk about, you know, the triune God and all that. But I think at the level of spirituality, it's just plunging into, into um, something that really cannot be expressed. Which probably, you know, now that I think of it, it's probably why I go to music. Um, because there's a sense of the text is limiting, and then you simply enter this world of pure sound, and you're drawn beyond text into something else. But mystery has a way of presenting itself in unique ways, and right in the middle of his life, filled with lyric, liturgy, and learning, everything changed. 2003 to 2004, I lost that academic year. <laughs> I was teaching at Notre Dame uh, in the spring of 2003, and had been asked by the sisters uh, at St. Mary's College, the sister school, to be someone who'd preside over the liturgies for Triduum. So it's now Holy Thursday. I'm in the midst of celebrating Mass. And I know something's a little off. Um, I was sweating like crazy, and I couldn't lift the chalice and the paten, the cup and bread plate. I couldn't lift them where I would normally lift them. And I thought, this is odd. By Easter Sunday, I drove myself to Memorial Hospital in South Bend. Again, completely providential. I got admitted. Within two hours, I couldn't walk. And on Wednesday of Holy Week, I got airlifted from Memorial Hospital to Mayo Clinic. And within 20 minutes, the doctor there, being very careful, he said, I'm just a resident, so I need this to be confirmed, but, I think you have Guillain-Barre disease or syndrome and uh, you will get better but you'll get a lot worse first. So that's all I remember for two weeks. I spiraled down that day, had to be intubated. Uh, my friends tell me that I struggled against that so they then sedated me and I think the sedation is also amnesiac. What I do remember from that period is a whole series of really, really psychotic dreams that are magnificent, I mean, with lots of religious overtones. At the worst, I could still blink one eye, and that was enough to be able to communicate with people. Stay tuned, and we'll bring you more of Mike Jonkis in just a minute. Welcome back to our conversation with Mike Jonkis. He had become an intellectual prisoner, physically confined by an attack to his immune system that stripped the protective coating off the peripheral nerves in his body. During that time, the rich tradition of ritual prayer he had come to love was taken from him, leading him to delve into the only connection he had available, personal prayer. I could start uh, praying for whoever had come in that day, uh, doctors, nurses, friends, whatever. And then I do this systematic kind of bouncing back and forth. The people in the room next to me on one side, the people in the room next to me on the other side, everybody on the ward, everybody on this floor, everybody on the floor above me, everybody on the floor below me. Then it just kept expanding, right? Um, all those who are suffering. The best part, I would, uh, I'd fall asleep. You know, just fall asleep praying, which is a lovely thing. So I think my spiritual life got transformed by uh, having Guillaume Beret. I think I learned how uh, how fragile people are. Uh, yeah, that, that we do not bring ourselves into existence. We don't, we, we have to tap into energies that are a lot deeper than the ones we're in, in, in control of. And that those energies are, are what keep us going. His newfound awareness has changed him deeply. I, I, there is one big change. I'm praying, I'm praying people a lot more. Uh, uh, 
people, you know, people come to communion and you see their hands. And how much life story is there? And, and then to, to kind of carry that, to carry those images with you. Uh, yeah, bring people. Prior to that time, it would be relatively easy for me to judge uh, both myself and other people. Um, you're not living up to your own standards would be my stance for me. You're not uh, being the best that you can be, you know, the army slogan, uh, when I looked at other people sometimes. Right? And then this, this shifted. I, uh, I now have a stance that says, most people are doing the best they can <laughs> most of the time. And you know, Admittedly, you know there, there can be solidarity with evil and all of that, but uh, I find it much less easy to be judgmental. Uh, yeah, it's changed how I'm a priest, also changed how I'm a, a theologian and an academic. Uh, the priest thing means that in some ways the the rituals that I'm expected to do in the name of the church have have become even more important they uh, they operated levels that I was not aware of before even that's hard language it's it's more uh, like a discipline of receptivity of, of of letting whatever that is out. I, I was really a, aware of this when recording a, a song for an album a few years ago. Uh, I had taken a, a Middle English poem uh, in which the Virgin is singing to the Christ child uh, and the refrain is something like, by Lalu, by sweet babe sang she and rocked him sweetly on her knee. think I'm gonna I have to solve a compositional problem I want a mezzo-soprano singing the virgin stuff but then I want women's voices singing the chorus oh boy and I'm gonna oh here I figured it out I'm gonna start with a unison line move it in two parts then they'll sing in four parts oh four parts but I think what I'm gonna give them is a quartal harmony chord rather than a nice triad it's just quartal and I think I'm solving a compositional problem right harp flute oboe background and then I'm standing in the booth when we record it for the first time I'd never heard it right? and I start to hear this and I'm just shattered because that one sequence when we get to the women's voices in the back there's a kind of dissonance that's set up who has vouchsafed from on high to visit us who were forlorn and suddenly it's the sound of all women keening you know over their dead it's just there it's just there i had no conscious awareness that that was i thought it was solving a compositional problem but there was something else going on that's for me that's the inspiration stuff you don't know <laughs> you work hard you use all the intellectual skill you've got and then discover there's something going on here that that I don't control. That I'm not in. That I'm I'm gi gifted is your word. That I'm gifted to be in touch with. But I'm not in charge of it. This increased sensitivity to the many levels at which spirit works may sound complex, but for Mike, the results suggest that his journey is bringing him to a new understanding of what it means to pray always. Now it's extraordinarily simple. You know, I still pray the, I, I love praying the church's liturgy. I absolutely love it. But as for particular times of prayer, uh, I just get surprised all the time. Hard not to love a good mystery.
Yeah, that I often use is, um, it's called gouache, but it's really a tempera, like what the kids use, only more expensive. And um, so I frequently use that, and I like the flatness of it. And sometimes I com uh, combine it with um, a colored pencil. It brings out the brilliance. What is it about some people who, when you're around them, you just feel yourself slowing down? When I'm going to do something, it takes a long incubation period, often, sometimes, sometimes weeks, sometimes months, and, and sometimes um, more than that, sometimes it'll be some years. Sister Ansgar Holmberg's relaxed energy makes me feel like even breathing is a little, I don't know, easier. And so it's like somebody's sitting here on my shoulder saying, this is, this is what you do now, this is what you do. Or, or, or your hand just does it, you know, and you get kind of surprised that it's doing that. Some call her work art of the heart. It's colorful, fun, reverent, and insightful. Some of the things that I do is, are um, pieces from scripture that have caught my attention, or sometimes it's something that somebody has said, you know, like in a talk, for instance. Um, that catches my imagination, so I try to put that down. When 9-11 happened and everybody was talking about that, and then one of our sisters at a meeting used the phrase, uh, a great migration of souls. And that was, that was such a positive um, turn. It was something that happened, but it wasn't just something that happened, but it, it happened within a within a, a greater whole, you know, that, that all these people who, who, who died, who were killed, um, were, were, part of, were part of the universe, were part of the, the divine, and that they, coming from the divine in the first place, they moved back into the divine, even though they'd never left the divine, because, because we are in, in the divine. When I talk with Ansgar, I get the feeling that she finds the divine in just about everything. I'll tell you something I saw the other day. I was getting out of the car at Crownlet Center, and there's this big, huge, probably 200-year-old cottonwood tree, you know, with most of its leaves gone, maybe just a few thousand left. And the sun was in the southwest low, and it shone on that through that, those tree branches. And it could only show through those tree branches because there were so many of the trees, I mean leaves missing. So it was almost naked, but there were still these few thousand leaves left. And cottonwood, I think it's a cottonwood, cottonwood um, leaves have a long stem so that when the wind blows, they spin. And um, the sun caught the leaves and they all sparkled like diamonds. They were, it was just a mass of diamonds, um, this, this tree. And um, there was something so much of the divine in that, that, that there was this old, this old tree with these, it, it was like electric sparks coming from each one of these as they trembled and as they twisted and turned. And it was, it just glittered. It glittered like, like sequins or like diamonds that were being turned but I'll never forget that. And I know that I always, whenever I consciously see a cottonwood tree, I'll remember that. And that's kind of like a, um, an image of the divine, that, that that spark is in everything. Everything is a teacher if we let it be a teacher. So I see that art is a teacher. It's a real teacher for me kind of makes me want to get out my paint by number set. Ever hear of Strasburg, North Dakota? It's the home of Mr. Lawrence Welk, winner of the Theodore Roosevelt Rough Rider Award. It's also the home of Hall of Famer, Sister Rosalind Jeffrey. Thing life through, I just sort of do whatever comes, but I was taking care of my mother. Um, you know, went home and took care of her three years, and I thought, well, I'm taking care of her. I'm not going to let my mind go to waste. And so I started taking a correspondence massage course, 
And the reason I did is because I had a massage. I had this internal chest pain, what's it, 12, 15 years. And I was in and out of hospitals. Um, and they never found the reason why I couldn't sleep at night, why I walked the floor, why I had to sit up sleeping. And just for no reason, whatever, I had the massage. And um, I slept every night since. <laughs> Today, when you hear about someone going to get a massage, you think nothing of it. But that wasn't the case when Sister Rosalind started her ministry. So one day I was biking down. I didn't have a car, so I was living on my bicycle. And I saw this place, um, massage, massage, whatever, parlor, whatever. And I went in and I thought, oh, that's great. I'm going to try a massage. And I said, you know, I want this massage. And they said, Oh no, no massage here. I said, there on the board it says massage. Not for you. <laughs> <laughs> I got very, very upset. I got so upset and I thought to myself, I'm going to do something. I don't know what, but to let people know what massage really is. Because why well, advertise for massage when it really isn't? Well, it was an amazing thing that I had no idea how I would do it, except, you know, I did start doing massage and then was closed down. The Vice Squad's experience with massage as a spiritual experience was a bit different than what Sister Rosalind had in mind. And I started to realize that people didn't think it was what I thought it was. And that disturbed me very, very badly. And but massage is tremendously healing, caring, loving, um, prayerful. And um, so they opened the door for me. Mm -hmm. So I just feel, you know, God is just so wonderful. It's like, I had no idea how I changed the image of massage, but God knew how to do it and there it is. Mm -hmm. And the tremendous publicity, so the press took over and did all the publicity of uh, changing the image through massage. Ah yes, the divinely inspired press. Well, Sister did go on to open a place for therapeutic massage. Then another, and another. Somewhere along the line, the St. Paul Saints baseball team asked her to give massages at their ball games. Well, that was another total open door. Uh, that massage got out very quickly, that it's not what the world thought it was. Then there were more clinics, and before long, she was opening schools of massage. You no, know, I never wanted schools. I wanted one room for me only. But with that closed down, which I thought was a horrible thing, really was a blessing in disguise. Because people heard about massage, they started coming, having massages, and then they started calling if they can come to my massage school. Today, she's got five schools throughout Minnesota and North Dakota. Then there's the foundation. That's for caretakers. Uh -huh. And the Hall of Fame. Massage Hall of Fame. <laughs> but this story is about more than fame and fortune. And I treasure people. Hmm. Uh, one of the things that God has done for me, I really love people. I really love people. And I know I huff them and I smooch them and I do all these things, but it really comes from the heart. I always felt when I deal with you, whoever I'm dealing with is, I'm dealing with the Lord, really. I was hungry, you gave me to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me to drink. I'm doing what I can with my heart and my hands. But um, um, Jesus, the healer, so in the end, Sister Rosalind is probably a little closer to that divine Hall of Fame than most of us. And of course, the reason is, if they can be saints, so can I. Mm -hmm. And she's not talking baseball. That's my aim in life, you know. Um, mm -hmm. I, I guess I just want to serve the Lord with all my heart. Mm -hmm. So that's the walk. Thanks for joining us today on In Search of the Divine. If you have questions or suggestions for us, please visit our website. Until next time, I'm Ann Thompson.